seven o'clock, so I think we'll start the meeting. Uh, so call to order. Please uh, join me in the flag salute. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The recorder is here, but you are just not a person. Oh, that's why she was so. Having called the meter order, I'll ask if there's any additions to the agenda or any declaration of ex parte contacts, conflicts of interest, bias, etc. Hearing none, so we can move on. Is there any presentations or comments from the public? Doesn't sound like it. Reese, do you have anything? No? Hello. Hello. <laughs> With that, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Mm -hmm. What would you guys like to do with the consent agenda? I would move that we accept the consent agenda as presented. I second it. There's been a motion and a second to consent to accept the consent agenda as submitted. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Moving us on to... The first item on the um, agenda, it's unfinished business and consideration of adoption of a property maintenance code. Uh, Dan, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, we were before you in July and then again in August to talk about this issue and I won't rehash all of the, the issues that were discussed at that time. But at the August 1st meeting, staff was uh, requested to create an ordinance for further review and discussion uh, by the council. Uh, you've got a draft in front of you. There's really no change to the code from what you saw before. It's just the creation all of all of the um, uh, recitals and the ordinance language itself. Uh, the proposal would be to uh, if the council chooses to go with it would be to enact into the city's code uh, standards for uh, residential rental housing and a procedure for enforcement of those standards. Uh, the standards that are proposed reflect state law uh, but are a little bit more detailed as to what the general requirements of uh, habitability are in state law. And, um, and also um, establishes a f annual fee to be collected per rental dwelling unit that would offset the cost to the city for enforcement and administration. Um, and with that, uh, really leave it to you all to discuss and decide whether you want to go forward. I will say, as I said in my uh, written report, and as I mentioned uh, last time we talked about this, um, would suggest that prior to enactment, if you want to go forward with it, that we do at least a public hearing, though one is not required by law, and perhaps some other outreach, particularly to the owners of rental property so they understand what the code will require. Any questions? If this were in, in force, say, 10 years ago, how often would it have been used, you think? It, it's hard for me to answer that, Ralph, because without it being in place, there's no reason for someone Right to call City Hall to complain. Uh -huh. um, I would say that we probably, that I'm aware of uh, in planning or public works, we probably get one or two phone calls a year mm -hmm. asking about questions that this may relate to. Of course. Um, how many come into the PD, I don't know. Yeah. And how many aren't, you know, again, aren't made because there is no no outlet right there is no code there's nothing we can do about it you know who really knows my only concern with this is that per unit fee uh, the idea of having standards for 
habitability in rentals makes very good sense to me. Um, but I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm. Hopefully, these other can convince me that Does it fee? that this that the fee will be uh, useful to us somehow I'm, I'm not sure how that I mean if we only get one you know we only get one and we've got all of these apartments <laughs> giving us fifty dollars a year or whatever number it is we come up with uh, it seems like an awful lot of money to enforce one one report yeah or two or three yeah I, I would agree if it's if it's that few um, then the, the fees probably not necessary uh, and uh, if the fee is the issue the fee could be removed mm -hmm. from the code from the proposed code I mean I that's, why, that's why when when you receive this information back in July and August the fee section was highlighted yeah uh, the, the other way that I could see us paying for this would be through penalties, you know, there's the 250 that it talks about in here. Well, maybe that could be five. Right. You know, I mean, if <clears throat> particularly if we have a landlord who's a problem, I think I think it would be incumbent for that landlord to kind of get their act together, so to speak. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with you. I have the same same uh, concern. Uh, the per unit concern. If you have 15 apartments in an apartment complex and mm -hmm. each unit's $25 or whatever we're going to charge them. And we're trying to get them to comply on his property as a whole. There was a question I had Dan about. I'm trying to find it here. It said, oh, here it is. Uh, under compliance, uh, page 6, 7B, it says, if a notice and order was recorded against the property, Housing division staff. Oh, that needs to be changed. Okay. That was something I missed from the codes that okay. I copied it from. I kind of figured it was not, yep. not a new position we were creating. I yep. wanted to no. make sure. No. Would we be able to leave the fee part open so that we may impose the fee by resolution? So then maybe for the time being we could say, okay, we don't want to impose a fee, but down the road sometime yeah. we could decide to impose something yeah I, I I mean as drafted the code would say there there is a fee to be set by resolution the resolution could have a fee of zero or just never be adopted so it, it I think even the language that's there accomplishes that great or we could say um, an annual fee may be imposed by council resolution I think it's really hard for people to find rental housing right now in town and these costs would most likely just be passed through to them and mm -hmm. yeah. then they'd the, have increased costs. Yeah. The cost the the cost um, in Corvallis is something like thirteen dollars per year per dwelling unit. Okay. In Eugene I think it's ten. Um, Gresham was as much as like fifty. But you know, that's so, but still only four dollars a week. I mean, four dollars a month. Yes, but <laughs> right. Yes, it is a cost that, that goes to the to the landlord. And I think my concern with that too, as well, was reading the appeal. It was fifty dollars to appeal to the council and or the city administrator for the person filing the complaint. Is that the way I read it? Uh, appeal. Because I mean that could be fifty dollars a substantial amount of money for someone on a fixed income having these types of issues with the landlord. I mean I guarantee you that. Yes, the code does have that fee right. in it, but again, that's something we that could, could we okay. could take out. Exactly, that fifty dollars would pretty much negate. Yep the whole purpose of this. I mean, that's almost a penalty <laughs> to somebody like uh, the counselor says that is on low income housing anyway. That's an appeal by the, by the landlord. That's an appeal by the landlord. 
It could be an appeal by the tenant okay. also. It could be an appeal by the tenant as well. If, if the enforcement officer determined there was no violation. So, Chief, can you can you tell us what this will enable you to do from a position that you can't do right now? A perfect example is the is the, the properties that we're dealing with currently, uh, where we are really stuck. We can uh, deal with the, the life safety issues of the of the fire the, the fire code, but to get them to uh, to fix. Some of the other maintenance issues that are going on that are that are safety issues for the tenants as well we're really kind of stuck with right and they're and they're they're really habitability issues i mean mm -hmm. there's a unit there that's had a, a broken window for over yeah, a year mm -hmm. there's no balconies and yeah and that window is still is still broken out mm -hmm. i drove past it yesterday right. and it was still broken out mm -hmm. anything else was there a spot in here that uh, we would give some type of uh, designation to the landlord that he meets the criteria set forth in the code, and we could put it on our website somewhere? Or how would we how would we make that known that this particular landlord is in compliance for people that are potentially renting from them? There's not a provision uh, for any type of inspection or certification okay. unless there is, a, a, there's no provision for inspection unless there is a complaint. Right. Uh, there is no provision, I guess the assumption is they that property, property is in compliance until it's found okay. not to be. I think that's one of the uh, highlights of that article you shared with us, Keith, in Albany, where they were gonna put some kind of designation uh, being approved, I, I think that's what I yeah the way I read it. They're doing yeah they're doing something very similar but just a, a little bit different. I mean I think that's yeah I I remember reading that same thing. So do you need a decision from us or? Well, I think at this point we'd like to know whether you know I think Dan's idea of, a, of doing a public I mean we've, we've discussed this mm -hmm. we, we understand that but doing a public hearing and, and to do notices and you know kind of say this is what our intent is I think that would be good so to, you know to give direction of saying yes we'd like to move forward uh, with that or just even saying you know we have we feel like we discussed this enough at this point you know just go ahead and let's go forward so I'll leave it to the council how you want to want to handle that but. I like the idea of having a public hearing mm -hmm. yes yeah okay there you go okay would you would you like anything done with the fees section before it's returned to you? I'd like to be able to set fees by resolution. And that's what it, that's what the well, current draft right. says. But, yeah. but also that fifty dollar filing or, fee for right, appeal. The appeal fee. Yeah. Drop that. Yeah. Or or say or that it would be resolution. set by resolution so we could have one at some point yep. if we want. Okay, that's good. And okay. then drop the per unit fee for mm -hmm. right now, correct? And then do yeah. we want to increase the, the fine? I know that was one of the discussions as well to make it sort of a to, to five hundred or I think a thousand. I mean, What's currently the, with with the issue we're dealing with, there's there's a, a fine of a thousand thousand dollars. A thousand dollars would match what our other uh, our other fee structure is for uh, issues of this nature, right? The the two hundred and fifty that's mentioned here is the penalty for not paying your ten dollar fee on okay. time gotcha that's the incentive to comply so that we don't have to send out uh, but repeat but notices i think council lewis made a good point about let's let's uh have it uh, evaluated after it's in place for to see how many of these we're actually going to field and how to right. respond to So we're good with that then you're gonna it seems like it would make sense to move all the fees to be set by resolution yep, so that right. we could right change them it. later yeah i agree <coughs> got it awesome so we can move on to new business and that would be the criteria for approval of applications for official zone map amendments that be me again yep so when we were um, discussing uh, Dick Koenig's um, zone map amendment on East Sandy Am Street, a number of council members expressed frustration over 
my interpretation over the inability to judge, shall we say, the overall appropriateness of the zone change and the impacts on the neighborhood beyond the, uh, shall we say, more objective criteria that are currently in the code. Um, I've reviewed uh, the criteria for approval for zone map amendments in I think it was six or eight other city codes um, and have a couple of uh, recommendations to make um, and otherwise are, I'm open to whatever you saw from other cities that you'd like to sort of pick and choose from that meet your concerns. But one of the one of the recommendations that I have to make is that I think what, one of the sources of frustration in the last case that we had was that they had applied for a zone map amendment and did not also apply at the same time for site development review. So while the applicant said, well this is my intention, he didn't really, he didn't have a site plan, we didn't really know what the impacts on the neighbors were going to be, all we were doing is changing the color on the zoning map without really knowing what the impacts of that was. Uh, I checked with the city's land use attorney and he didn't have any problem with the idea of uh, requiring a concurrent application for development to accompany the zone map amendment application. Um, I w if, if you want to proceed with that, I would leave an exception to allow for someone who's got a non-conforming use today and really just wants the, the zone map change to make that conforming. Um, I don't know who was on the council when we did that six or eight years ago for property at First, and I think it was first in Virginia where there's a multifamily house that was zoned, multifamily building that was zoned commercial. So that was a non-conforming use. And we changed the zoning to put it into the downtown residential mixed use zone. So again, there was no development proposed or wasn't gonna be any development following, so it would make sense to provide an exception in that case. Um, the, other issue, the other recommendation is that um, to, to craft language that, that includes a new criterion for compatibility with the potential development with the existing neighborhood development patterns. Um, that, you know, that may get a little subjective and be up to a lot of interpretation. I think we can craft language, I mean, and you'll see that other cities around have a similar criteria to that, and that I think we can craft the language that provides guidance to both the applicant and to council as to how that will be applied. And then other than that, I'm open to hearing your ideas for if there's other things that you saw that in these cities that I included uh, that you like and would like to include. I think the way we do it now is fine. I do think that there should be, as you said, um, what are we gonna do with this property when we get the zone changed? That should be there um, so people can see it. But I think generally, I think it's fine the way we do it. I, I agree with you. I mean, I like the objective criteria. <laughs> I don't think it would hurt to add a compatibility component, but I, I still think we would have passed the one we um, okayed um, based well, he on met compatibility. All the criteria. Yeah. yeah, he met all the criteria, so I, we almost didn't have a choice. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's exactly it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't have a choice. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that give the the community members in town an option. 
to express. I mean, they could express their frustrations with it. But their option is tough. I mean, that's the way I. That's the way I took it. So, so do you think this would? I don't make, know. Make that better. <laughs> I don't know. I, I do like this piece from Salem. That this is this is what I was trying to maybe. Maybe this sentence really articulates it for me, and I'll, I'll make sure I want to read this correctly. The very last sentence on Salem's. Salem's. Um, piece says, the greater the impact of the proposed zone change on the area, the greater the burden on the applicant to demonstrate their criteria are satisfied. He clearly satisfied all six of the criteria we had in mm -hmm. there, but again, for me, that didn't take any consideration of the people that are li living in the neighborhood already. Yeah, and that's what I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm just trying to find a balance of right. input from both both sides. That's mm -hmm. all I'm trying to do. And it's interesting to see that all the towns around us have, in my mind, that. Yeah, something option. like that. I think it's. I think it's compatible. Yeah, let me ask you this: um, the concurrent. Piece. Does that save the Planning Commission or yourself any time, effort, whatever, when it comes to... So now that uh, Mr. Koning got his own change, he's going to have to come back again and go through the entire process again. Correct. I, I do like the concurrent piece simply for that reason that it cuts down on right. the duplicity. Right. right. Um, it, it would save a little bit of effort because it would be one public hearing mm -hmm. that's... Um, you know, another recent example was uh, Mr. Martinak's zone change uh, on West Washington Street. Um, when we did that, he he did submit concurrent applications. That was a, actually a comprehensive plan map amendment, a zone map amendment, and a partitioning all at the same time. So it was one public hearing before the Planning Commission that looked at all three applications. They they did their job, the z comprehensive plan map and zone map amendments came to the council, council held their public hearing, um, and, then, and then it was done. And you're right, I, the, the, draw, the potential drawback is if it is really a, if it's got something that is potentially controversial, uh, and particularly if it's also a comprehensive plan map amendment going from residential to commercial, let's say, then um, the applicant may be a little hesitant to spend the money on all of the engineering that's necessary for the site plan, to develop the site plan right. without knowing whether the zone map amendment is going to go through. I got gotcha. you. That that to me the the probably the most significant drawback to requiring a concurrent application okay. is it, it does put all of those expenses up front on the applicant without knowing whether they're going to get the zone change uh, i can see that i i think part of the issue for me is what it does is it reduces the the rumor mill and the innuendo and the unknown the fear of the unknown a lot of the people that came here were the fear of the sure. unknown. i heard it's gonna be 17 houses right. or whatever right. the number may be right and so i'm trying to figure out a way to yeah, like to have and, it. and I think by and I think I think having the concurrent application helps resolve that. Now the applicant's not bound to do that development. Sure. They could come back next month with an amended plan sure. or a whole new plan or just never build it. We you know we did a zone you know again just in my ten years here we did a zone change um, for Brian Wixom his property at um, uh, Jefferson and sixth. and sixth. And nothing ever happened there. He had great plans, and then the economy fell apart. But we changed the zoning from residential to commercial for him. That was so. Um, you know, they're not bound to actually execute the plan they get approved, but at least it it gives uh, the city officials and it gives the public an idea of here's what is planned and here's what you're likely to see. Well, that makes me think maybe they shouldn't be doing it concurrently because what if they come and say, oh, yeah, we're going to do X, Y, and Z, and then as soon as they get the zone map approved, uh, amendment approved, go and decide to do something else. 
But they could do that they, anyway. Right. Yeah. They can. Right. They, they can do, do that, that anyway. anyway. Well, that's why I think we you should know, look at the zone map on its own without. And then I mean, yeah. How often does this come up? In the, change of in the ten years I've been here, I think there's been five applications for a zone map amendment. Hmm. <laughs> so it's not a big deal. No, right. it's not a big. I guess I put myself in their shoes again. I just feel powerless from a resident standpoint that I don't have a say in what goes on in my neighborhood. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. But but how much say should you have in someone else's property and what they're doing with it? You know, there should be some autonomy too. Sure. That this is my property and I want to develop it and I want to get, you know, abide by the rules, but but we're changing what well, that property currently is zoned. Mm -hmm. And by doing that we're affecting everybody else in that surrounding deal. It's a, it's it's tough. It is, it is, and and you know I think you take um, uh, the example of of this last application where people bought, you know, bought into a single family neighborhood uh, with the understanding that the property next door was zoned single family. One of those houses is less than a year old, and now it's not going to be single family. Now, what is what going to be there going to be terrible? We don't know because we don't know what's going to happen other than, than, you know, Mr. Koenig said, my intention is to build a triplex. That's all we know. That's what I was getting at. I mean, I knew full well, or I didn't know, what the zoning next to me was at the time I bought my house. I assumed because the nature of the congruency of the neighborhood was going to be another couple more houses. But now I know. All right. But just to your point, if I go in there buying it, knowing full web that lot's going to be a single family house, great. That's why I bought it. That's what the attractiveness of the lot was, right? Or the attractiveness of the area. And now to come in and say, guess what? We're changing it. Because he owns it and he asked the city to change it. And us five up sit, sitting up here on the council overrule the wishes of the neighborhood. That's a struggle for me. And we, and we, and we deem that from a quasi judicial standpoint because they met the criteria of the six steps. Right. That's all we're looking at. We're not taking That's anything right. else into consideration other than the six criteria. Right. But the statute says it has to be objective criteria. Yeah. So that's what we're stuck with. Right. That's why I was looking for a mechanism to maybe have a little bit more. Right. I I don't I don't know whether this I don't know whether the statute for uh, requires objective criteria for a zone map amendment. It certainly does for resident for housing development or what the statute calls needed housing, which is defined pretty much as all housing. Um, when you look at the criteria that that some of the neighboring communities have adopted, um, you know there's some pretty subjective things here. Um, you know Dallas, the change is in the public interest with regard to neighborhood and community conditions. Um, uh, Salem, the proposed zone is equally or better suited for the property than the existing zone and then goes on to describe what that means. So those, uh, those provide uh, the, you know, those types of criteria provide the council with some pretty broad latitude. I mean, it's not much different than, than looking at our criteria for approval for an annexation, you know, one of which is there is the need for the land in the city. And, and there's absolutely no guidance to either the council or or the applicant as to what that means. So it really really leaves it up to you to determine, do we need this land or do we not need this land? Um, so I, I, I don't think there's any problem with a, with a subjective criteria, but um, 
without it, we're, we've got those six that we have today. So where would you like to go? Include the include a requirement for a concurrent development application or not? I I personally don't think that's a good idea at this point. The concurrent piece because of the burden it places on the right. Now af after discussing it, mm -hmm. I would concur with that as well. I just don't feel like. The way it's set up now, we have the ability to actually be representatives of the people. And I certainly didn't feel that way in the last hearing. Yet all those folks here who live in town, who are coming to the representatives that they elected to try to help in a situation to express their, uh, their frustrations or their concerns with their property and their neighborhood, and we were pretty much bound by the objective criteria just to make a ruling from a quasi-judicial standpoint. How oh, did you like Salem's number two? That yeah, last line I did. Uh, yeah. The one with the compatible? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. So who determines the greater impact? I mean, is that... But ultimately going to be up to the council and yeah. it's going right. to need to be based on information provided on the record. So then <clears throat> and, and, let's and continue to using Mr. Koenig and let's say we, we go, uh, we now have seven criteria with this being number seven and he gets the other six but he doesn't get number seven because uh, we decide that what he's trying to do isn't for the greater good because we have a whole room full of people telling us it's not for the greater good. It's, it's, it's difficult for me to, to, to say no to a guy because, because of that. I don't know. I mean, he's already met all these other criteria that um, I don't know. I, I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I, I do. But the, in my mind, it goes back to, and, and this is what I was trying to articulate without being too, without being too harsh on people that live outside the community. And that wasn't my intent. What I was always saying was, there's got to be a voice for the people that live there that are being affected by yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Having owned that property and his options of developing the property are to develop it as, as it was zoned. Mm -hmm. And he's asking us for a zone change. And yes, he met the criteria based on those six mm -hmm. options. So there's what, that's why I struggle with the weighing. So what the community wants versus what he wants. That's what, that, that's what we're, that's why we're at this discussion. Right. You're right. I don't, I mean, six out of seven, and then what is that, I mean, what has that weigh? Yeah. Right. On the future of us, people are sitting here in the future. To, to a, a certain extent, the, the question of how you make the decision of whether something is compatible may not necessarily be all that different than how you make a decision as to whether anticipated services can accommodate potential development. There's information presented to you. Someone could question whether the pipe is big enough or whether there's enough water or not enough water. Uh, same with, with uh, transportation impacts. Um, we, my experience here in Staten is we never get in, I've never, we've never had an application where the neighbors show up with, with their own expert witnesses, so to, so to called, but actually are presenting um, analysis different than what the applicant's analysis or the staff's analysis is. It's always just we don't like that, or we're or we're afraid of that. So right. I think there is the opportunity 
even with some of these more objective criteria, and even if you had a, a criteria about compatibility, there is the opportunity for the neighborhood to come and present information, and that's really the key, mm -hmm. about whether the application is compatible or not compatible. Even if you had um, a compatibility criterion and all the neighbors came and just said, oh, we're not quite sure we like this, or we're concerned what the impact will be, that doesn't, I don't think that would provide adequate information for you to make a finding that it's not compatible. I agree. Right. I agree. So it, it really, it, it will need to be an information-based testimony, and that's usually what's lacking when the neighbors show up at a hearing for anything. But I know that we've had things at the Planning Commission that were voted down because enough of the neighbors came. I mean, we don't have a skate park because of that. Right. Right. We don't have a development up on the other side of East Pine Street. Right. Because there were 65 people in this hearing room mm -hmm. before the Planning Commission and the application never even made it to the City Council. Not to mention the economy fell apart soon afterwards. But right. We'll Ralph, I see your point. I just, it's tough. It's tough. <laughs> I don't know what to say. I mean, you, you surmised it pretty well. The people that are coming are, are going off of emotion. Yeah. Right. Instead of presenting factual arguments against the criteria. Right. To deny the. Yeah, and in, in the case of Mr. Koenig's application, none of the testimony addressed any of the criteria for approval. And even if you had a criterion about compatibility, may not have adequately addressed that. It was, oh, I live in a single family house, I don't want a triplex behind me. So I guess then the question would be, how do we get past that? How do we get neighbors to be more professional in their, in their approach to these things, as opposed to being, oh, God, they're going to put a, you know, <laughs> a whatever in my backyard? Yeah. Um, I don't know how you do that, particularly in a community like this. In other communities, uh, the neighbors will go hire their own engineers or, the, or, an, or an attorney will be representing them who knows what needs to be done. That's not, uh, that's not gonna happen here, uh, except perhaps in selected neighborhoods. Um, and otherwise, people my experience here, as well as other communities I've worked, people come to the public hearings and go, I don't like this, or I'm worried about this, mm -hmm. without addressing the criteria for approval. And, and, you know, our notice that goes out says, these are the criteria. Your testimony needs to address them, or, or it, won't, it won't be worth much. I mean, it doesn't say it that way, but that's what it says. <laughs> Generally what it comes to. Yeah. I think the struggle, I mean, what you guys have is, is two classic competing values in public administration. It's the individual rights of the property owners, the social equity of, of, of the citizens in the community. And ultimately, it's, it's going to be the decision of, of where you want to place the priority on those values. And that's, I think, it's where the struggle is really coming from, from you know, hearing it from you guys. And I, I hate putting it in like a public administration, technical, esoteric kind of way, but that's really sort of, of what I think the struggle is right now, is those two competing, competing values and trying to, to balance how you want to do that. I'm just saying that to maybe give an idea of, of where we're at and how we can maybe overcome it. So let's say, let's say we took Salem's number two, which says the greater the impact of the proposed zone change on the area, the greater the burden on the applicant to demonstrate that the criteria are satisfied. 
<clears throat> how would that impact, do you think, the audience? Because this, this will be now one of the, this will be number seven, so when they get their notice, this will be on there for them to well, take into consideration. Yeah, I, actually this probably wouldn't be a number seven. Mm. Because as, as Salem has structured it, number one is it says it shall be granted if all the following criteria are met. So mm -hmm. that's what lays out the criteria, A, B, C, D, E, right. F, and G. G. Right. And then two says the bigger your impact, the greater your burden to show that okay. the criteria above mm -hmm. are met. So um, it, it may give um, the neighborhood or the neighbors or the opponents a, a better opportunity to say the applicant hasn't met their burden of proof. Mm -hmm. And it is the applicant's burden to provide that information. It's not the neighbor's burden, it's not staff's burden to, to provide information that shows the criteria are not met. So it, it may give the opportunity for a more savvy uh, neighbor to say, Mr. Koenig's having a big impact on our neighborhood and he hasn't met his burden of proof of showing that criteria three and four have been met. But it doesn't change the criteria. No. So that, <laughs> so that doesn't do anything. I, no. I, I, I really. don't think it no. does much. I no. mean, the applicant's got the the applicant's got the burden of proof already. Period. Yeah. Period. And and uh, by saying uh, because you're going to have a big project, your burden is bigger. I mm -hmm. I don't think says anything. The applicant's got the burden of showing that A through G, in Salem's case, are met. Mm -hmm. I, what about uh, under number one, A, uh, second paragraph for Salem? Is that any different? That, that is different than, different than anything that we have in our code mm -hmm. today. Because it talks about the compatible would be compatible with the vicinity's development pattern. Right. Well, so would that have afforded that neighborhood a, l a little bit different uh, angle? I think it would have provided the opportunity to argue that what Mr. Koenig is proposing is not compatible. I'm not quite sure it would definitely be a slam dunk sure. argument in that case. Sure. Because in that case, We've, you've got multifamily, you've got medium density mm -hmm. right next, door. Right next, right right door. next right. door and right. you've got a couple of duplexes and you've right. got multifamily across the street and, and you're, we're really talking about changing the zone line from one side of the property to the other side of the property, not like you were creating right. a new zoning district Nine in the middle of, of something. Right. And they'd still have to poke holes in the six criteria, Right. solidly poke holes in them. <laughs> I, I like what we have. I would like to have a compatibility um, aspect added to ours just so we don't have islands of yeah, yeah that's something in the middle of. Agree. Mm -hmm. Agree. So. so kind of along the language of what Salem's 1A II says, when you're talking about compatibility. Yes. That's, that's what, what we're talking about. What, what, that's what, what Dan yeah. suggested too. Um, the compatibility of the potential development under the new zoning to the existing development patterns in the vicinity. Yeah, so that, that was sort of a general concept in, as a recommendation without I'll, I'll let, picking I'll somebody. Let you but yeah, then we can play with up. that okay. language okay. if that's the direction you want to go. Does Salem's language sort of kind of meet that of the one I just described? A demonstration that there's been a change in the economic, demographic, or physical character of the vicinity such that the proposed zone would be compatible with the vicinity's development pattern? That's the one I have highlighted, yeah. Yeah. I mean, didn't that, Dan, does that seem kind of along those lines? Yeah, Maybe that's along those lines, bit. as is their, their um, sub three there, that, that the proposed zones equally or better suited for the property uh, based on the physical characteristics and the uh, uses allowed in the zone zone are logical with surrounding land uses. Yeah. 
So, you know, again, I think both two and three get to that compatibility issue. Um, and and, and there's, there were some others, you know, from, again, other um, communities around, um, where was, So I'll, I'll come back. I guess the question is, would you like me to come back to you with language before it goes to the Planning yes. Commission? Yeah. yeah, I think it's important yes. to have yeah. the okay. full council. So we'll be back in a couple of weeks with a suggestion. Yeah. To address the compatibility issue, and we will not deal with the concurrent application. That's Thank you. what I heard right. the majority of you saying. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Super. Thank you. Thanks. I wanted to make a statement for the record that Councilor Glidewell and Mayor Porter both excused tonight. I forgot to do it at the beginning. <laughs> Oops, so benevolent of you. Oops, to yeah, them. sorry about that. Um, this is another chance for a presentation or comments from the public. Can I comment about that thing? Sure, go ahead, Reese. Um, do I say the Reese Bordeaux 525 <laughs> Mill Stream Woods? Huh. I guess even though we try and say that we're different than other areas, I was thinking as a neighbor of sublimity, and I always ask people when I meet them at anything, if they live in Staten or sublimity or where they live, and then how they chose it. And I meet a lot of people who tell me they chose sublimity because it has housing and not the apartment, the types of things that we have. Um, not the stores and the issues. I mean, in reality, there are, what, 2,000 people there, and they have one officer? We have 8,000 people, so four times more. And how many officers? 13. 13. So I think that there is more stuff that goes on in Staten, a lot more stuff. Um, I live where there are apartments right outside of me, and I don't think there's anybody here who would want and and was it not a threeplex and a twoplex stand so five places not just a triplex wasn't that right well no there 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 is the theoretical potential perhaps for that parcel to be partitioned into two and for one of those lots to have a triplex and the other to have a duplex. Okay, but I thought I thought that's what he did say. The said his intention is to build a triplex. Just a triplex. Okay, so. Um, but he hasn't. But again, he hasn't submitted an application okay. to do anything. Okay, so I really would appreciate it if you do put language in that does something, maybe a little like Salem. I also think that bigger cities spend a lot of time exploring. And, and there are reasons why they add that kind of language. And I think maybe the homes up by the hospital, maybe behind the park, they might get an engineer or they might come in with somebody who would speak for them. But I don't think the majority of neighborhoods around no. here have people that can do that. They aren't going to do that. They, don't even, they wouldn't even probably know how to begin. And, and I think they do vote for you. And I think it's great if you do speak for the majority of people. Thanks. Thanks, Reese. Um, that leaves us with business from the city administrator. Um, so we'll look at the two items tonight and make some adjustments to our future agenda items to try to get these back as, as soon as we can. So um, we'll take that and we have our staff meeting tomorrow. We'll look and try to let you know when we'll get both of these back. I think the first item, just to give us time to notify, might be um, probably initially thinking sometime in November. Um, we'll see how fast we can get that, that second item back as well. So just wanted to kind of let you know what the thought process was as we do that. So we had talked some internally about that as well. So we might make some adjustments to the future agenda just to handle some of those things. That's all I have. Thanks. Uh, mayor's gone, so we will skip that. Business from the council, anybody? Uh, future agenda items are cost and revenue alternatives on October 17th and financial policies. Other than that, meeting's adjourned. <laughs>